The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm delighted to be here and, and uh, to see you and, and my colleagues here as well. And I will be um, splitting my time with uh, my good friend from Lac Saint Jean, sorry, Lac Saint Louis. Um, and I want to start by acknowledging that we are gathered here on the traditional unceded lands of the Algonquin people. Um, and I'm going to keep my, um, uh, my speech, my response to the speech from the throne uh, to one specific issue, and that is of racism. Uh, I know there's many aspects uh, that are in the throne speech that, uh, that I would love to speak about, including long-term care uh, as well as others. Uh, but I believe that uh, the pandemic uh, has heightened the discussion around racism, and I want to uh, focus my, my energies on that. And I want to acknowledge the, the work of uh, the Canadian Parliamentary Black Caucus uh, and their uh, advocacy, um, as well as uh, the enormous amount of young people who have more or less been on the streets in the last several months. And I'm so inspired uh, by, uh, by really seeing a, a, a resurgence of the civil rights movement in, in our lifetime, and, and, uh, and I want to thank them uh, for their enormous work. There's three aspects to racism when we talk about racism um, and how to tackle it, how to, uh, I would even dare to say, eliminate it. Uh, there's really three components that I want to talk about. And first um, is the idea of um, eliminating barriers, eliminating the systemic barriers that exist for for people uh, to achieve their truest and fullest potential. Um, secondly, it's about um, uh, making sure that we equalize the playing field. We have um, equal support, equal uh, starting point, so that um, everyone, again, can, can, uh, can have the, the best that they're able to achieve. And, and finally, it's about empowerment. It's about empowering uh, individuals to uh, to to, to uh, climb uh, greater heights uh, and to be able to uh, to really um, get to a, a point of self determination where they can uh, control uh, their destiny. Um, but in Canada and, and in many parts of the world, um, it's not so simple because uh, the starting point, in fact. Um, uh, in, in Canada, for example, I know the, the leader of the opposition yesterday spoke about uh, how uh, it was his party and his uh, uh, founding leader, um, uh, Sir John A. Macdonald, who founded Canada. Um, and from his perspective, he may be correct, but it is fundamentally flawed understanding of the history of this country. Um, and when we talk about, for example, the Indian Act, how, um, how the Indian Act has disenfranchised um, First Nations people across this country, in, from their lands, um, from their families, from their livelihoods, from their traditional ways of life, to the loss of language and culture. This is systematic. We saw the effects of residential schools and, and a very moving statement yesterday by, by my good uh, and dear friend uh, from Winnipeg Center uh, about uh, her, her experience with residential schools vis-a-vis uh, -vis her, her partner, um, Romeo Sagnesh, who was a former member. Um, and, and we cannot even start to compre comprehend the depth of hatred that one needs to have in order for us to develop laws of this nature. And then we know about the forced relocation. Um, of, uh, of, of Inuit, and the killing of sled dogs, execution of Louis Riel. And these are, again, moments in time. But one would think that COVID is colorblind, that COVID is a pandemic, is a virus that doesn't see color, that doesn't discriminate based on one's identity. But we know that's incorrect. And we have statistics. We have excellent statistics from the United States, from the United Kingdom. We are emerging to have some statistics from, from Canada. Um, Ontario Public Health, for example, has said that people in the most ethnically diverse neighborhoods were three times higher 
than to, to um, get COVID-19 than those in the least diverse neighborhoods. In Ottawa, 66% of those uh, local COVID-19 patients were racialized, whereas their population is only 54%. In, the, in Toronto, for example, a staggering 83% of COVID-19 cases between May and July were that of racialized people, even though they only constitute 52% of the population. And according to the same data, black people had the highest share of COVID-19 cases, 21%, which, in, 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 uh, to put it in perspective, they constitute in, in, in uh, Toronto, for example, 10% of the population. So COVID-2 has demonstrated the, uh, the uh, racialized outcomes that we see in many other aspects of our, uh, of our systems. But let me just illustrate the many disturbing images we've seen with respect to racism in the past several months. And, and I really don't think this House has enough time for us to go case by case. And the number of, of outrageous things that we've seen in our social media, but also the enormous pain that people face each and every day trying to address this. And George Floyd, I think, was a spark. I think we can agree that uh, the, the, the death of George Floyd was a spark for all of us. Um, and this was a 46-year-old black man in Minneapolis who was killed by the police. Um, and we saw since that time an enormous number of, um, of cases that have come forward. We saw with disgust the way Chief Alan Adam, Chief Alan Adam, who is the chief of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, who as a country we are trying to build a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with, was roughed up by Canada's police service, the RCMP. It is offensive to the core, Mr. Speaker. I, I still don't have the heart to see the, the way that Joyce Echequan was treated in Joliet. I've read about it, I've, and I've read many, many articles about it. I still have not seen the video. Because the way that she was treated or not treated, or mistreated, should offend every single Canadian. Yet, there's more. We know that Mohammed Aslam Safis, who's a 58-year-old Muslim man, was killed at the International Muslim Organization Mosque. He was a caretaker there. He was killed on September the 12th by a neo-Nazi on an Islamophobic um, attack. And there's Mona Wang, there's Ijaz Chowdhury, and there's Regis Kershinsky Paquet, who were all died because of wellness checks. And we know that many incidents of hate, motivated by hate, takes place across the country. So today, we're at a crossroads. We're at a crossroads in the world, but we're also at a crossroads in Canada. This is the time for us to recommit, and as the Prime Minister said in the throne speech, redouble our efforts to address the root causes of racism. And it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be overnight, but it needs to be coordinated, and it needs to be an all-out Canadian effort. It needs to start by acknowledging that systemic racism is there. That is not up for discussion. It is about ensuring that our laws, for example, on min mandatory minimum sentences, are changed. It's about ensuring that we have an equal playing field when it comes to the criminal justice system. It's about ensuring that we, we continue on the path towards reconciliation, ensuring that we, we uh, bring into law the U U United uh, Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. It's been far too long we've avoided these conversations, but it's important that we take bold steps today and build on the many things that we've done in the past, including the national anti-racism strategy. But that's not enough. We need to continue on this path, Mr. Speaker, and I hope 
my colleagues across the aisle will continue to work with us on this and to ensure that we're able to build a country that will work towards eliminating um, and empowering and equalizing um, uh, matters for, um, for Canada's Indigenous people as well as bl uh, black and other racialized minorities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.